Hey guys, it's Anna, and this is part two of my best books of 2017. Picking up where we left off, I'm going to start off with a YA novel. This is The Love Interest by Kale Dietrich. Don't have the book with me because I, I believe I borrowed it from a friend and then actually gave it back. That's a good book borrowing stewardship approach. The Love Interest is a satire of typical YA romance conventions where there are these two teenage boys that are supposed to um, seduce, I guess, and romance this one girl, but they end up falling for each other instead. Next up on the list is Eliza and Her Monsters by Francesca Zappia. This is a YA novel um, about this girl, Eliza, who is famous for creating a webcomic, Monstrous Sea, and what happens when she's in danger of someone in her real life finding out that she is the creator of this webcomic. One of my favorite things about this book that I thought it did really well was it portrayed online fandoms in an accurate but also like feels inducing way. A lot of times YA authors I think don't really get the internet or maybe that was more of a thing when I was actually in the sort of young adult age group. I guess I'm a little bit older than that now, but they never really were able to successfully write about the internet or the way that like teenagers and young people actually use it and the way that people interact with fandoms, but this book did such a good job of that. Fantastic. Next up is How to Make a Wish by Ashley Herring Blake. This is a young adult contemporary novel about a bisexual girl and a love story. Again, great love story where nothing super tragic happens to either her or the girl that she gets into a relationship with. This does deal with some um, kind of tenuous family dynamics. There's no like violence or anything like that, but I guess there'd be like a trigger warning for um, addiction in this book. I believe the main character's mother struggles with addiction. Next up is The Essex Serpent by Sarah Perry. This is an adult historical fiction novel. And can we just pause for a moment to admire the gorgeous cover of this book? I know everybody that I've seen review this on booktube talks about how gorgeous the cover is, and they're not wrong. It also just has a very pleasant tactile feel. It almost feels like rag paper. I know it isn't, but it could be. It could be if you squint. Um, the Essex Serpent is about these queer lady Victorian geologists that are coming to terms with um, the Victorian issues of science butting up against religion, and it's really good. It's really kind of atmospherically creepy. Nothing actually particularly scary happens in this book, so don't worry, it's not like a give you the heebie-jeebies, but it definitely gives you kind of a, a sense of the eeriness of the landscape, I'll say. Great book. Okay, next up is Priest Daddy, which is a memoir by Patricia Lockwood. This book I sadly don't have with me anymore. Um, I jettisoned it in the great Seattle Move book purge. R.I.P. Priest Daddy. But I really, really enjoyed this book. It actually made me laugh out loud. It is about Patricia Lockwood's growing up with her father, who by sort of a technical fluke was able to be both a Catholic priest and a husband and father. Normally in the Catholic Church, the priests are not allowed to marry, have children, things like that. They're expected to take sort of a lifelong vow of celibacy as part of their vocation. But there's various things that happen that mean that Lockwood's father um, is actually able to become a priest. This book is not for the faint of heart when it comes to things like gross body humor, body swearing, like whatever, whatever it is, like maybe this isn't the best book to give to like your granny unless she's awesome. But I really enjoyed it as somebody that grew up Catholic whose dad almost became a priest. I really appreciated a lot of that like irreligious humor that Lockwood brings to the story. And also I may or may not have spit out my drink more than once laughing while reading this book. Next up is American War by Omar El Akkad. This is actually a book that I got from Book of the Month 
which I, now that I think about it, I will be leaving my link, my referral link down in the description box. I don't get any money from this. It's basically just if you sign up using the link, they'll give me a free book and then you get your own thing where you can get free books as well. So enough for the book of the month plug. Um, this American War Here by Omar el Akkad is a speculative fiction adult novel about this girl, Sarat Chestnut, who grows up in a sort of not too distant future United States where the government has kind of collapsed because we can no longer really rely on fossil fuels. She's living in the South, which has decided that it's going to secede from the rest of the country. The United States is kind of fragmented into a bunch of different little, I guess, autarkic territories is the best way to put it. And it is about what happens in times of war that causes people to become radicalized and to do things that they normally wouldn't do in times of peace. Surat is radicalized as like a sniper and a person that is just hell-bent on killing as many of the enemy, whoever that may be, as possible because of the terrible trauma that she has suffered as a child who has known nothing but war growing up. Omar el Akkad, the author, is a journalist, and he, when he wrote this book, did something similar to Margaret Atwood in The Handmaid's Tale, where he did not put anything in this book that has not happened in the world at some point, whether it's part of contemporary politics or something that has happened in history in the past. That is what the inspiration for this book's world and the, the um, things that the characters encounter comes from. Fantastic. Next up is The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. This will come as no surprise to anybody that it's on one of my best books because, hello, it won the National Book Award and it's really great. This is kind of a, I want to say like a speculative historical fiction because it takes place in the actual like span of United States history, but instead of the Underground Railroad just being a like loosely connected network of safe houses and a system for slaves to escape to their freedom in the north of the United States, the railroad is actually a train that goes from house to house that the two characters have to sort of hop on and ride a literal train on the Underground Railroad to freedom. Um, this book obviously comes with some trigger warnings for things like racism, um, racially motivated violence, violence against women, but it is a fantastic read. It is unlike any other historical or speculative fiction novel that you've really ever read. I'm saying you because I'm making assumptions about what you read. Wow. Good job, Anna. Early days and you're already making assumptions about the viewers. Maybe it isn't unlike anything you've ever read. If so, please let me know what it is like because I would love to read another book that's like this. Next up, we have Queens of Geek by Jen Wilde. This is a YA contemporary novel. And again, here's like the theme for the second half of this video is that I really enjoyed reading books this year that have just accurate, nuanced, and fun takes on fandom and geek culture. So I actually went to my first geek convention this year. Um, this was actually after I read the book. But having been to a sum total of one convention and going to another this weekend, I can say that this was absolutely spot on in portraying the sort of geek Christmas atmosphere of a convention, of the excitement of cosplay, of seeing vendors making all different kinds of crafts based off of your favorite fandoms. This book also has really great queer representation. Um, there's like women loving women, whether that's through bisexuality, pansexuality, sexually fluid kind of, I'm figuring out what my identity is, which again, really love that. This managed to avoid the stereotype of I don't like labels while at the same time just being a great exploration of the fact that sexuality is not something we always have figured out 100% all the time. Sometimes it's fluid. Sometimes it's an experience to explore and figure out what type of words you want to use, what type of way you want to identify specifically. Um, this is... Also, a book that has anxiety and mental illness representation that feels very organic. It doesn't feel like the author is using that as like a buzzword to sell the book, which is something, unfortunately, that I have noticed, especially in YA. A lot of times it'll be like, this book is about anxiety, and then it just kind of has some very harmful stereotypes or representation or just something that like you can clearly tell is not 
not accurate at all. So that was Queens of Geek by Jen Wilde. I will be rereading this as part of my goal to reread books in 2018 just because it was darling. It was darling. <laughs> Next up is Your Welcome Universe by Whitney Gardner. I originally got this book from the library and then it came in a book subscription box. I don't remember which one it was because I only tried it out for a couple of months. If I can figure that out, I will link it down below in the description so that you can kind of see what else came as part of the box. Your Welcome Universe is the story of a deaf teenager who is expelled from her school for defending one of her best friends who is getting slut shamed by other people in the school. She goes to an all deaf high school originally, but after she's expelled from the school for uh, graffitiing in defense of her friend, she has to become mainstreamed into a regular public high school where she is the only deaf kid there. She also really wants to be a graffiti artist. She's very good at it. Um, but at the same time, she's trying to deal with adjusting to her new high school. She's struggling with a little bit of a graffiti turf war. Somebody keeps coming and like tagging and painting over her graffiti and she's getting really annoyed trying to figure out what it was, who it was, I should say. At the same time, she's also beginning to maybe make a friend with a hearing girl at the school. Um, this book was really fun to read. I really enjoyed how just punk the main character was. She just took no shit from anybody. I wish I had been like that when I was her age in high school. Um, the main character is also biracial and has two moms. So again, that's something that like is great to see in a book. It isn't uh, necessarily the focal point, but it is a big part of like her identity and who she is without being simply a marketing ploy. Next up is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. This is a YA contemporary that I'm sure will be no surprise to anybody that this was on my list of favorite books. This book kept me up all night reading it. I had to like catch a plane the next morning, but I couldn't put it down. It was absolutely incredible. Um, I won't spend too, too much time going over the plot summary because it's been talked about to death all over booktube, but it is about a girl named Star who sees her um, childhood best friend shot and killed by the police and she has to deal with what she is going to do in the face of that and how she's going to respond. Um, it puts the story of the individual within the context of the wider Black Lives Matter movement with the wider questions of justice reform in America. This book is incredible. It's being made into a movie. Cannot wait. Also follow Angie Thomas on Twitter. She's a great Twitter follow. I'm going to read everything she writes now. <laughs> Okay, the next few are former library books, so I'm going to read off of my little notebook here. Uh, we Are Okay by Nina LaCour. This was a really short, heartbreaking, but also heartwarming story about a girl. Um, she's like raised by her grandfather, and he suddenly dies, and she's kind of cut herself off from everybody that she's ever known. She's cut herself off from her girlfriend, her community, her family. And it's the story where she's going to be staying in her college dorm over winter break because she feels like she has no place that she can call home. And it's the story of her girlfriend coming to visit her, find out what's wrong, see if maybe they can move forward and heal from some of the wounds they've been carrying around. Wonderful book. Um, next up is Saving Hamlet by Molly Booth. That was a YA contemporary slash historical fiction, which I adored and I cannot wait for her next book. It is about a girl who um, is a stage managing her high school's production of Hamlet. Clearly I'm a sucker for the Shakespeare adaptations, so if you have any like good recommendations for those, leave them down below please. Um, so she's stage managing her high school's production of Hamlet when she falls through the trapdoor in the high school stage and wakes up in Shakespearean England and finds herself unexpectedly thrust into the role of stage manager of the actual play Hamlet, directed by none other than William Shakespeare. This book also has great queer representation. There is some uh, sort of like parental rejection, so I guess trigger warning for homophobia there, but it Next up is Homegoing by Ya Jesse. I used to have my own copy of this, but then I wound up uh, giving it to my mom. Don't know if she's read it, but if you're watching this, mom, let me know if you've read the book and what you think of it. Or if, you know, you're not my mom and you read the book, let me know what you think of it. 
Um, Homegoing is the story of two African sisters, one of whom is kidnapped and sold into slavery in the United States, and one of whom um, is not really left behind, but she just is still in Africa growing up. And it is the intergenerational story of their two families uh, growing up and like having very different experiences in Africa and in the United States, and then eventually uh, melding back together. That okay. Next up is Kissing the Witch, Old Tales in New Skins by Emma Donahue. This is a short story collection of fairy tale retellings from a queer feminist perspective. Pushing all the buttons for Anna right there. This does have some trigger warnings for things like body horror, but no more so than like regular fairy tales, like dealing with bodies, doing weird things. I really enjoyed the way that Donahue linked all of the fairy tales together, where like the ending of one will end on a certain thought and then a narrator from that story will pick up and start telling the next story with the thought the previous one ended upon. I really enjoyed the different romantic relationships and friendships that Donahue was able to create between familiar fairy tale characters. And this is definitely a good introduction to her work. If you haven't read anything by her before, she's written a ton of other novels and short story collections, I think maybe even some poetry. I really did enjoy this. And finally on the list is a book that I no longer have with me because it was lent to me by a friend, but this friend also lent me the second book in the series, and that was Endymion by Dan Stevens. It is, excuse me, Endymion by Dan Simmons. This is part of an adult science fiction. Um, it was like a trilogy plus two, so there's a trilogy, but then there's like two extras added on. I accidentally read Endymion, which was the third book, before I read this one, The Fall of Hyperion, which is the second one. Endymion is amazing. It is great if you sort of like epic scope science fiction stories, if you are interested in the confluence between literature, religion, and science. I really, really enjoyed it. It's hard to describe what the book is about without giving away major spoilers for the entire series, but suffice to say, if you are looking for an epic science fiction series, Dan Simmons is your man. I'm going to read this. Hopefully didn't get too, too spoiled for what's going to happen in it this year. All right, and that is it for part two of my best books of 2017. Comment down below if you have any thoughts on the books that I read or any questions. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you like what you see. I'll be posting a new video as frequently as I can. Bye.